Well, it is a delight to be here with my good friend, Pastor Tim Ginter, and uh, to have some time of fellowship last night with uh, your First Lady here, and it, it's, it's a joy to see what God is doing. I've been all over the world. I've never seen anything like this. This is great. I love it. This is wonderful. So keep it up. Keep it up, and if you would... Next time I'm here, I want the walls to be about another 50 foot this way and 100 foot that way, whatever you need to do to get them all in here. That'll be wonderful, and I'm just thrilled for what God is doing. As Pastor Tim mentioned, I work for the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C., and if you're not familiar with us, in 1983, Dr. James Dobson was... Uh, Seeing, He was in Washington for a, a, an event with then-President Jimmy Carter, and he sensed God speaking to him about a, a place or an organization that would be, bring biblical worldview perspective to the conversation regarding legislation and policy. And so FRC was formed as a policy organization and a think tank, and we still are. It, about 20 years ago, Tony Perkins came as our president, and Tony brought with him a, a, a past, more of a pastoral focus as a pastor himself, a, a Marine, a police officer, legislator in the house in Louisiana. And he realized the importance of pastors engaging culture, speaking biblically to culture. And through his leadership began the Watchman Pastors Network that is nationwide, thousands of pastors who have joined with us to pray, to preach, and to partner and influence their world, influence this nation from a biblical worldview perspective. We started community impact teams around the country in churches, and we're still creating resources that speak in real time, real time to what's happening in culture through a biblical lens. We have a newspaper, the Washington Stand, Tony's daily television and radio show, Washington Watch, and other avenues of communication and we also, uh, we have a Center for Biblical Worldview that George Varney is a part of. And each and every week, I get to share the resources of the Family Research Council with pastors, church leaders, and nomination leaders around the country. And so it's just an incredible honor uh, to be with you today and spend time with you. The year was 1774 when in Virginia, in the House of Burgess, uh, there is a the picture that I want you to get here, uh, a slide that, that shows you this place. Uh, what's notable is that in 1774, in retaliation to the little tea party they had in Boston and other uprisings, the King of England imposed what we know as the Intolerable Acts. One of them, the Boston Port Act, shutting down commerce to the colonies, and the men who were in the House of Burgess serving, you would know some of them, Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, George Mason, a guy named Patrick Henry was there, and they were the governing body under the authority of the king at the time. And so when they heard what had happened, they responded. Now it's worth noting how our forefathers in this nation responded. The first thing they did, was call for a day of prayer and fasting. They passed a resolution, it passed unanimously, calling for a day of prayer and fasting. When the king's appointed governor, Lord Dunmore, heard about it, and that next slide reveals him walking into the House of Burgess, waving the resolution, castigating them for not coming to him for help, but, but, uh, but doing something on their own. It kind of sounds like government. Let me help. I mean, anyway, uh, they... they uh, they were fired, literally. He, he dismissed them. Lord Dunmore said, you're fired, go home, your business is done. And they did this. In that room, there was a tall Virginian from Fairfax by the name of George Washington, the next slide depicts. He said, gentlemen, follow me. So they went down the street to a place called Raleigh Tavern there in Williamsburg, Virginia. And they did two things. They repassed the resolution calling for a day of prayer and fasting. And they kept it. In George Washington's diary, he records how he kept that day of prayer, fasting, and humiliation. But then at that same little gathering, they decided to reach out to the other colonies and see if those members would be willing to come together and discuss perhaps uniting as colonies or, or states. 
And so in September of 1774, 1774, in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, just a few doors down from Independence Hall, they gathered. They gathered to discuss what would then lead to the next Congress and the next Congress, a declaration a few years later. You, we know the story. But I want you to see something. Before they did anything in Philadelphia in 1774, just as they had responded in Williamsburg, these leaders called a local pastor by the name of Reverend Jacob Duche to come in. And the next picture is a picture of that first gathering, the first Congress in September of 1774. Reverend Duche read from Psalm 25, made some remarks, and then prayed such a moving prayer that John Adams wrote to Abigail saying, even the Quakers wept. So it was a doozy. But I want you to understand that our history, the history of this nation, is built upon the foundation of men who responded to challenge and responded uh, to, to the things they faced by first and foremost going to God in prayer. This is who we are. This is where we came from. This is our history, our legacy. And we must not forget that and not allow revisionist history to tell some other story because we are blessed to live here in the United States of America. We've got a godly heritage and we celebrate that. Amen. Before John Adams died, they asked him, who was it? Who were the people that were most influential, who had the most impact? And when John Adams was asked this question, uh, look, look at how he responded. He said this, and I, I need that slide so I can read it to you. He, he said, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew, the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper were two of the individuals most conspicuous, most ardent, and influential in the awakening of the revival of American principles and feelings that led to the Declaration of Independence. Who did he look to? Who did he, who did he refer to? He referred to pastors. He referred to men of God who responded to the moment. He could have named a host of others, but his response was, it's the pastors, it's the churches. In fact, Noah Webster, who was a founding father as, way, as well, would say it this way. He said the learned clergy had great influence in founding the first genuine Republican governments ever formed. And with all the faults and defects of the men and their laws were the best Republican governments on earth. Listen to this. At this moment, the people of this country are indebted chiefly to their institutions for the rights and privileges which are enjoyed. Who's he talking about? The church. It was the influence of the church that set the stage that God used to bring about our, the founding of this nation, which this little 4.3% of the population of the world has touched the world in more ways than any other nation in history. 85 cents of every dollar that goes to missions comes from this little 4.3% of, of the population of the world. More men, brave men and women, many who are here today, have served this nation, bringing freedom and blessing to others in the world. More from this little nation than any other nation in history. And if we don't know our story, and we don't know why, we may lose the greatest freedom the world has ever known. And we need to stand strong in these moments. I want to mention, amen, this is who we are. Uh, one more quick thing, and that is when the founders came together in 1776, uh, they were influenced greatly by a man that is not spoken of much. His name was John Locke. He wrote a little book called Two Treaties of Government. You can still buy it on Amazon. It's about 400 pages long. But what's noteworthy is its influence. John Otis, who was a mentor to Sam Adams and John Hancock, said this. He said that the, the writings of Locke are preferred above all others. And John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, he said the Declaration of Independence was founded upon the same theory of government expounded in the writings of Locke. Why does that matter? It matters because in 400 pages, the Scriptures are referenced over 1,500 times. This is our history. This is who we are. And let me say to you today that God has entrusted the stewardship of this moment to us, to the influence of the church here in America. And what we do matters. We must stand for truth. Now, standing for truth, standing for truth takes courage. Standing for truth takes strength and focus. 
let me, let me pause and shift gears here just a moment. It was August 31st, 1983, when Korean Airline Flight 007 took off from uh, New York City. It was headed to Seoul, Korea. It went to Anchorage, Alaska, where it refueled, and then it took off again. And in its, in its flight, as it took off, this is 1983 technology, the autopilot didn't engage correctly. There was just a little thing off, but it, it, it changed their trajectory. Now, after an hour or so, they were only off by 12 miles. After five hours, they were in Soviet airspace. Now, the, the, the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States and the Western world, much different then in 1983. And we may never know exactly what happened, but what we do know is that a Soviet fighter apparently shot down Flight 007, killing all 269 passengers and crew in 1983, somewhere over Russia. The black box was never, decover, never recovered. Now, I want you to think about this. If the point of departure is off just a little, just a few degrees, the, the, the deviation can, can end being, uh, the end result can be disastrously, overwhelmingly uh, disastrous or even deadly. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said something profound I want to begin with as I head into the Scripture this morning. He said this, Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. That's where I want us to, to look today. And we love John. I love John's, John's uh, way of communicating. I like his wording. He, uh, the Word became flesh and, and, and dwelt among us. We love that from, from the book of John. Uh, I, John 3.16 gave us, of course, the perhaps most used passage of Scripture to share the Gospel in, in short order with people all around the world. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And John 14, I love John 14, as he paints the picture of Jesus leaving, but He's coming back again. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. We know that, and we love that, that John gave us. John also gave us a, a beautiful picture of, of the resurrection and, and, and His his defense of the resurrection and his experience when he, when he wrote about beating Peter to the tomb in the foot race after they had heard that Jesus had raised from the dead and, and how he stood there and he looked in. Peter ran right in, but there John looks and it, he said that, that, that he looked, he beheld, and he believed. I love that. We love that. In fact, John tells us why he wrote everything. He said all, all that's written is written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. But here in 1 John, this is 95 A.D. or so, years have passed. The, the, the generations have changed. And now John is looking around and he's seeing something that's just a little off. And it doesn't take us long to, to absorb John's posture and the place John finds himself in to look around us in our nation and in our world and say, hey, that's just about like today. There's a lot of things that are called religious, many things that are, that are related to the church, but there's something just not right. The trajectory's off just a little. And remember, the trajectory being off can, can cost, cost greatly. John is seeing second and third generation believers and, and, and uh, he's, he's hearing things that are greatly troubling to him and he's, he's a little concerned about what's going on around him. First John chapter 1, look at this with me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. 
That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. He, he's, he's writing to make sure that what Jesus said and what Jesus did is not perverted. It's not tweaked just a little or watered down in any way, shape, or form because he realized the danger of that taking place. In that day, history was passed along verbally. It was, it was um, oral tradition that carried the story forward. And in our day, it's vastly different in Western culture, but in that day, they would tell that story over and over, just like as we get close to Easter, we see the, the influence and significance of Passover and how that the Jewish people would tell that story of over and over and we'll celebrate it again this year. John was seeing some things and he was hearing some things that red flags were going off. Perhaps you've had that experience when you would hear a pastor say something or you would hear the church endorsing something and you say, no, 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 that just sounds wrong. There's something not, not right about that. The trajectory is off. And so John is addressing this, and he's speaking to this. He sees, he sees um, uh, orthopraxis, or wrong practice, going on. He sees, he sees, uh, sees uh, heterodoxy, wrong belief everywhere. And he's, he's seeing these things, and he, he knows something is wrong. And so he stands up, and he addresses this in this little letter, the beginning of the, the three little letters that he wrote here. And he's worried about what's happening, so he wants to make clear everything be understood. And I think what we have here is, is John's testimony, not of the resurrection. The testimony of the message of the gospel needed in a, in a time when there were those who were believing things that were just a little wrong. Remember, again, Chester's, or, uh, Spurgeon's words. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. So, what does John say? That which was from the beginning, we read that, which we have heard. John said, I heard him speak. <laughs> John's saying, I, 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 I heard his voice. Now, this is a first-hand account. If anybody had credibility, it was John. There were others that were believing this or teaching this, but hey, this is John, and he, is, he was there when Jesus spoke. Maybe you had, this, you had this happen to you where you walk into the break room or walk into a setting or a meeting or a family gathering, and they're talking about, they're telling a story or retelling a story. And as you listen to the story, you think, that's, that's, not, that's not how it happened. I was there. I was in the room when that happened, or I was there when this happened a few years ago. And, and what you, you speak up and you say, wait, 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 I, I was there when that happened. This is how it really happened. When you, when you say that you were there, you qualify yourself. John is qualifying himself so that they can know you're going to hear some things about Jesus, but I heard him speak personally. And that matters. I work in Washington and I'm around some great people wonderful leaders time to time I'll meet folks that uh, uh, were in certain places at certain times uh, our executive vice president is a man by the name of retired lieutenant general Jerry Boykin he was a founding member of Delta Force he was commander of forces in Grenada and Panama and he was the commander of forces in Mogadishu during Black Hawk Down and I've been in rooms hearing him tell stories, and I, maybe you've watched the movie, but I've heard him tell stories that are a little different from the movie. But he's qualified because he was there. He was there when it happened. He knows exactly what was said and what took place. Listen, what we preach isn't based on polling. It isn't based on something that has been watered down. This is the truth of God. Jesus is Lord, and we must not forget that. So he heard him. Then he says, that which we have seen. And he goes on, which we have looked upon. One, one commentator said, boy, John got excited, and he just kind of restated the same thing. Actually, no. He said two different things there. 
He said, we've seen. That's the, the Greek word haron, which means that, that uh, with my eyes I physically saw. Like I'm looking at you. You're beautiful, by the way. And I, I say that to people all the time, but I've never said it to people in cars. But it's true. You're a beautiful bunch. <laughs> I see. I see. I've seen him with my eyes. But then he... But then he states something that sounds like he's repeating himself, but he's not. He uses a different word. It's the Greek word thessali, which means to behold with understanding. John says, I heard him, I saw him, but I got who he was. I understood who he was. He's the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He really did do what, he, what, what we said He did. He really spoke what, he, what we said He spoke. We saw Him. He really did perform the miracles. We saw Him. He really did die on the cross. We saw Him. He really did rise from the dead. We saw Him. And just as He gives us that picture back in the Gospels, as He goes and sees the empty tomb, He didn't just see Jesus. He understood who Jesus was. We can, we, can, we can be off just a little. Oh yeah, I believe in the church. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. But wait a minute. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? The Son of the living God. God's only begotten Son. John's clear in all that He communicates in who Jesus is. And He was hearing things that were a little off. So He qualifies that. One more thing He says here. It says, "...which our hands have handled." The word of life. We've touched him. We didn't just hear him and see him and get who he was. We touched him. Now this is a big deal. It's a big deal in that setting, and I'll we'll we'll we'll, we'll go to that in a moment. But remember when when Jesus rose from the dead, and and in Luke twenty four we have this moment with Thomas. He's not there, and they, he, Jesus comes, and then he. Jesus comes eight days later and Thomas sees him. Behold my hands, my feet, that it's I myself. Handle me, see that a spirit hath not flesh and bones of you as you've seen me have. And in John 20, here's Thomas. He said, Lord, I, I, I believe. I, I, Lord, my Lord and my God. He, he believed just by seeing him there in John 20. He rose from the dead. And Jesus allowed them to touch Him. They, they touched Him. They knew He was alive. He wasn't just a spirit. He was alive. He, hear me now. We're going to celebrate this in a few weeks. But Jesus really did rise from the dead. Amen? Now John said that for a reason. Because he was dealing with a false, a couple of false teaching. One was... What, one was what the ascetics believed and what they taught, but the most prominent was the Gnostic belief. They believed the knowledge of transcendence arrived by way of intuitive means. It, and Gnosticism expresses its way, and get this, in, in a specific religious experience that does not lend itself to language of, of theory or philosophy, but is instead closely affinitive to and expresses itself, hear me, through the medium of myth. Now you say, well, I, what, what, what's the big deal there? John says, I heard him. John says, I saw him. I, I touched him. And you may think, well, that's thousands of years ago. Why does it matter? It matters because today the gospel has been watered down. Christianity has been watered down to the place where there's teaching of Jesus and maybe the gospel but they've taken some things out just to accommodate this thought of it's as if Jesus rose from the dead. It's as if He healed those who were sick. John is warning, and he goes on to warn of antichrists. Antichrists. He warns of wrong teaching, wrong living. I've, I've always heard that it would get bad, but man, we are here. <laughs> you see, if Jesus really did rise from the dead. If He really did, if, if that resurrected body was a physical body and death was defeated and the grave was defeated, if that happened, then Jesus, God's Son, really did come to earth. If He really came, then the account of His death is true. 
if he actually died and was seen of many and touched, the resurrection really, really happened. If someone came back from the grave, then they have power over death. That makes them the Son of God. Their claims are true. They, they must be dealt with. You can't put this off. You can't just say it might have happened. It actually happened. And if that's true, then we have to admit we are wrong and that there is a God, there is a heaven, there is a hell, and I am a sinner, and I've got to repent and walk another way because the Word of God is true based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, if Jesus rose from the dead, it matters. And John was dealing with this Gnostic belief that it's as if Jesus had a physical body. Serentheus was the, the focus, by the way. Jesus discipled John. John discipled Ignatius, who discipled Polycarp. All of these stood in opposition to a man by the name of Serentheus, who promoted this Gnostic view of Christ. And again, you say, well, that's thousands of years ago. Why does it matter? Rudolf Boatman, a German thinker who died in the 60s, taught something we recognize and see in various forms as the Jesus of history versus the Jesus of faith. He's known for his belief that the historical analysis of the New Testament is both futile and unnecessary, and he argued that all that matters is the thatness, not the whatness of Jesus. Only that Jesus existed, preached, and died by crucifixion. That's all that matters, not what happened throughout his life. And he relied on this uh, tearing down of theology and destroying the New Testament truths. You ever wonder why someone can call themselves a Christian and believe something that's not biblical? This is why. Because in schools of higher learning, they have, they have, through liberal theological approach, they have deconstructed the faith of millions and millions of young people who grew up in church, and they reconstructed something that was as, as if. Let me, let me explain it this way. This reasoning teaches that the disciples sat around after Jesus died, and because we all know that nobody can really rise from the dead, that, that, that we've got to find a way to communicate who Jesus is and was and His great influence. So we'll just begin with the premise, it's as if He rose from the dead. Future readers will know He didn't rise from the dead, it's just a metaphor. And they will know that the Jesus of history is really still dead and buried, but the Christ of our faith rose from the dead. That's, this is, so every miracle is dismissed. The calming of the sea, well, that just, that just teaches us that Jesus calms our hearts, everybody's hearts. The, lie, the five loaves and fishes, well, Jesus has the capacity to feed the souls of, of many. And systematically is the destruction of truth, it's off just a little, the destruction of truth of the Scriptures. And so if there's no resurrection, as John alluded to, if there's no resurrection, well, there, no, there were no miracles. No miracles, there's no God, there's no Word of God, there's no standard, there's no sin. There's no Savior, no need to repent, no forgiveness, no Lord over you. And, and if that's the case, then anything goes. And welcome to 2024. In the Center for Biblical Worldview at the Family Research Council, George Barna polled or, uh, thousands of Americans, and he found that only 6% of Americans over the age of 18, have a biblical worldview. See, your worldview is the emotional, spiritual uh, filter, an intellectual filter through which you see and understand the world. Every worldview is formed between the ages of 2 and 13. And by the time you're 13, you'll have a worldview, and a child will have a worldview that they will probably live the rest of their lives with. And you might just wonder, what are the most influential things in culture today. What are the things that have the most impact in culture? Well, the list is, is a little broad by children, teens, and adults, but across the top, movies, television, music, internet and social media, then books, uh, then government, then family. For children and teens, it kind of switches off here where it's uh, peers, Adults are a little different, and then you go a little lower, the next level down of influence, you've got peers, you've got celebrities and athletes for teenagers. And what's not listed in the top ten is the church. 
You see, we are, we are biblically illiterate. We're also historically illiterate in our culture. We don't know the story of our history that I mentioned earlier. We're civically illiterate in our culture. We, we don't know how, gov- many don't know how government works. They don't know how government works, locally or state level or federal level. And if you don't know the Bible and you don't know your history and you don't know how your government works, do you know what can happen? Anybody can say anything, and most people will believe it's true. Again, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. And as John was concerned, so must we be concerned. And I believe that that John calls us today. I believe he calls us to a few things. Let Let me pause for a quick reflection here. I was speaking at a class in Columbus, Ohio. It was, it was at Worthington Kilbourne High School. It was a public school, juniors and seniors. The class is called Poly Rad. Just think about that name, Poly, many, rad, radical thoughts, many radical perspectives. And they, they would bring me in to talk about what the Bible says about a particular thing, what the church would believe. And so the topic, I think it was 2019, the topic was the transgender movement in education that I was speaking to. And there was um, someone who was radically different from my perspective on one side, then I spoke. And when I finished speaking, I took questions, and there was a young man who asked question, a question. And I'll never forget it. I tell this, I, I told it in Roanoke this week. I told this in, in Charlottesville uh, Friday. He asked this question. He said, what would it take for you to change your worldview? I said, nothing. I can't think of nothing that would make me change my worldview. He said, what if your daughter came to you and said she was gay? Would you change your worldview? I said, no. Then he asked the same question a couple other ways. What if this? No. What if that? No. And then he sat down. It was a metal chair on a concrete floor. Everybody looked. It was, he was upset. When we were done, he came up to me, right to me, and he said this, he said, I want you to know I wasn't upset with you. I was upset, he said, because you have something that won't change. Now, listen and think about that. This young man, representative of millions of young people in America, this young man has never had an absolute, something solid, a biblical worldview foundation that no one could change their mind regardless of what's happened. They're, all they've known is fluidity in faith or belief or something. There was nothing solid that they've experienced in their lives. Representative of much of our culture. So as John looked at his landscape and he saw this moment, I, I want to suggest that John gives us some things that we could we could probably draw from this that we can apply as we live for the Lord in this moment where compromise and, and capitulation seem to be the, 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 most, the most effective ways to many to deal with opposition to the truth of who Jesus is, who God is. I, I, I want to suggest to you that... I, First and foremost, that we need to know Jesus like John knew Jesus. Can somebody say amen to that? (laughs) We need to know Jesus like John knew Jesus. There was no question in John's mind. He, He knew, he understood who Jesus was. This wasn't something anybody could talk him out of. This wasn't something that anybody could say, well, have you ever thought about this? No, he wasn't, he wasn't swayed by anything that, that he had heard or seen. He knew what he believed. And if there's ever a day that not only must, me, must we know what we believe, we must know it in such a way that if someone asks us a question, we've got a good answer. This is biblical, by the way. We're to be ready always to give an answer to those who ask, Peter said, uh, of what God's done in our lives. But the week I got saved, I got saved when I was 14 years old. And I was telling, uh, telling uh, your pastor and his dear wife last night, the first week I was saved, they took us, out, took us out to witness in the little town where the camp was. 
And I got to lead somebody to Jesus the first week after I got saved. I didn't grow up around church. I didn't know anything about church. I chased a little girl to camp. And I got saved. That's probably a story others have, but I, that's, how, that's how I came to faith. I was This little girl said she was going to camp, and I thought, well, that's where I want to go. Well, the Lord showed up, and I, ne I never got over it. And I did marry the girl, by the way. But that, <laughs> thank you. That, that first week, I, I, I shared my faith in Jesus. And do you know, I, this is just me. This is just me talking to you here. I've never had to change that message. That was 1979. I've never needed to change that message. It's still just as fresh and new today. That message hasn't changed. Jesus still saves. You can know Him. You can experience His presence in your life. You can, you can be near to Him as you, as you pray, as you search the Scriptures. As we draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to us. You can be as close to Jesus as you want to be to Jesus. You can know Jesus like John did. And know Him so well that if anything false presents itself as gospel, then the red lights flash and the whistles go off because that's, wait a minute, there's something a little off there. You begin to sense and discern that this isn't God. And we need to know Jesus so well. I, I've had many, many people in, in banking that used to tell me that that's how they used to discern counterfeit bills. Not by learning the counterfeits, but they knew the real ones so well that if they saw something that was fake, stood out like a sore thumb. Know Jesus like John knew Jesus. Secondly, I think that that we need to make Him known. To make Him known. In a world that desperately is seeking truth. Passing along a godly heritage. Let me speak first to the families that are here. The, 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 the parents and, and, and those who are raising children. The greatest, most important thing that you will do in the life of your child is impart to them your faith in Jesus Christ. To teach them, to teach them what it is to know God, to teach them who God is in such a way that they, they, they're not going to vary from it. We, we like that scripture from Proverbs that, that tells us to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. But that literally means, and a rabbi told me this in Israel one time, he said that means to create a taste for God. He said that the Hebrew moms would take food and they would reach, take a little piece of that food and they would reach in the mouth of a child and touch the palate of a child and they would hence create an appetite for that food. And that's what that means to teach, to train up, to create an appetite in the hearts and minds of those who we influence, who God has allowed us to pour into and be a godly influence. As a pastor, I would look uh, around and I would see, I, my mind goes to a, a man by the name of Johnny who got saved when he was a teenager down in Ashland, Kentucky. And because of his faith, his whole family came to faith. Now I met Johnny after he, he raised his children, but his, his granddaughter came to church one Sunday morning and she was standing beside him in the lobby and I, I couldn't, I almost cried thinking about, she, she has no idea the difference in the trajectory of their family's heritage in Christ that was determined by a young man who just went to church and got saved as a little boy. And because of that, he raised his children in church. And because of that, she is being raised in church. It has a lasting impact. So we are to know Jesus like John knew Jesus. To make Him known like John made Him known. And in the face of false teaching in the face of Antichrist, in the face of all that John was looking at, he never backed up or stopped. You read on. John would continue to proclaim who Jesus was. Uncompromisingly, faithfully, and courageously. He lived it. He made Him known, which leads me to what I think that God's handed to us in this moment. And that's the call to share Jesus that the world may know. If they're going to get this, if they're going to hear the truth of who Jesus is, if they're going to hear truth, 
what really is truth. They're not going to find it in the, in the media outlets, probably. They're not going to find it in government. They're not going to find it in Washington or Wall Street or Columbus. They're going to find it in the Word of God that is alive and well in the hearts and lives of men and women who they come into contact with each and every day. God again has entrusted you and I with this amazing moment so that with uncompromising clarity and character we can stand for Jesus and share the life-changing message of the Gospel everywhere we go, in everything we do. Now, I, tr- I travel a lot, and I fly a lot, and I'm here and there and everywhere. 27 states last year, many of them multiple times, and I've gotten to know uh, American Airlines and uh, United Airlines folks in Columbus real well, and, and I, I don't know how many times I learned, and I don't know what it is. I really don't. I, I'm sure pastor probably feels the same way. Somebody will ask me, are you a preacher? Are you a pastor? I don't wear a suit everywhere I go, but I don't know what it is. Maybe I've got a card that I carry and everybody just, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know what it is. But people know. They see something in us that we don't even realize is there. And I would imagine where you live, where you shop, where you buy your gas, where you work. There are people that know and pay more attention to you than you you perhaps ever consider. It matters that we know Jesus like John knew Jesus. It matters that we make Him known like John made Him known. It matters because the world is counting on us to do the right thing. Ronald Reagan in 1981, in his inaugural speech, uh, introduced us to a man that we perhaps would have never known. He was a, he was a leader in Boston in the 1700s, and his name was Dr. Joseph Warren. And he was part of, actually, I, I was told, history tells us he was part of the group that planned and maybe executed the Boston Tea Party. I do know that on the first anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, they had a little gathering there in occupied Boston, and they picked this guy to give the speech or give the pep talk uh, to, the, uh, to the folks in, in Boston that were involved in the, the revolutionary uh, activities. He, now, he, never, he never lived past the first few battles. He died at Bunker Hill. But he did say in that speech something that was profound. In fact, Reagan used it and quoted it. He said, he said this. He said that our country's in danger but not to be despaired of. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. What a line. What a truth. We must stand for the truth of God's Word. And by the way, there people, this is not a new thing. It wasn't new here. And over the years, it's, it's gotten bad in America, but it's, this has been going on for some time. I know we're getting close to Easter, and one of, my, one of my favorite stories is about a man by the name of Alfred Ackley. He was a pastor in California, and he, uh, he got up early on Easter Sunday morning, and he was going to prepare to go preach. And he's listening to the radio because the, the East Coast pastors were preaching their Easter message. So he's listening and there was this liberal theologian, theologian somewhere on the East Coast who was saying it, kind of the same theology I mentioned earlier. It's as if Jesus rose from the dead. And man, it hit him square uh, in, in his heart. And he said, wait a minute, that's not true. That's, he really did rise from the dead. And he hollers at his wife, did you hear that heretic, what he said? And so he, he goes to church that Easter Sunday. He preaches the resurrection like he never preached it before. And he, he, all afternoon, he's still talking about that liberal theologian and what he had said. Goes back Sunday night, preaches it hard and loud and strong. Comes home and his wife, pastor's wife, she had had about enough of his grumbling. She said, just go sit down and write your feelings. Basically, I've heard enough. <laughs> so he goes in his office and he begins to write. And he writes, I, I serve a risen Savior. 
He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I feel it, hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. He's alive. He's alive today for you and for me. And whatever needs we have, and may I suggest that whatever needs our nation has, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Greater is He that is in us, John would say, than He that is in the world. And so I have hope. I want to introduce you. The next slide, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned Ronald Reagan. He was uh, in seven... In, there's some Reagan, Reagan fans here. Uh, in 1976, Ronald Reagan lost the nomination for president to Gerald Ford in Kansas City, Missouri at the convention. And Gerald Ford did something. You can go to YouTube and watch what I'm about to tell you. Gerald Ford invited then-Governor Reagan to come up and say a few words. Now, I've heard many people tell this that after Reagan finished his few remarks that everybody in the arena said, we nominated the wrong guy. But the, 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 he, he made his remarks, and in his remarks, you can watch him, he's talking about different things. His, his moment is to unite the party there. But he, uh, he says, it's almost as if he diverts from his, his message. He said, you know, he said, the people of California asked me to write a letter. I'm paraphrasing here. I write a letter to go in a time capsule to be opened at the tricentennial of our state. And he said, I've been thinking about what I should write, what I should say, what I should mention. And he missed, mentioned a few topics. And then he kind of turned it around on the audience. He said, what would you say? What would you write? And, but then he, then he said this. He said, it occurred to me that a hundred years from now, when they opened that time capsule, those that read that letter they're going to know. They're going to know whether or not we did the right thing. 50 years ago, 100 years from now, they're going to know. Now, I want you to meet two people that are perhaps the most important people in my life. And because I have somewhat of a control here over the pictures you see, I want you to meet Kyrie and Spencer. They're my grandchildren. And all the grandparents... And all the grandparents said amen. Uh, six years ago, Kyrie was, Kyrie was six. And she asked me, she said, uh, what are you going to do, Papa? Because uh, I'd preached my last sermon in Circleville. And she says, what are you going to do? I, dumb like, I thought, I'll explain this to her. I'm going to work for a family policy organization in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to go. And, and her little eyes just kind of glassed over and she was dialing out. I was losing her. And so I said, honey, I'm just going to try to save America for you. And she, she said, okay, and just toddled off like that's all I need. Just, just be simple, Pap. Just tell me what you're doing. The next week at school, she was in kindergarten, the teacher was a former youth member of my first pastorate, and she said to Kyrie, she said, Kyrie, I heard your grandpa is retiring. She said, no. She said, he's saving America. <laughs> well, I, I laugh about that. I laugh about that. But as many Sundays as possible, those two little, sweet little folks are at my house. And my granddaughter will ask me, where are you going this week, Papa? And I'll tell her and We'll look on the map, maybe find something that I should see while I'm there. And then I'll come back with something from there, pictures of that for her. I can't, I can't count the number of times she looked at me and said, Papa, are you still trying to save America for me? 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, those sweet little children that represent the sweet ones in your heart today that you're thinking of, they will know whether or not we've done what we should be doing in this moment that God's entrusted to our stewardship. So I want us to think about that. 
I want us to think about our stewardship of what God's given us. Do we know Jesus like John knew Jesus? Are we, are we making Him known like John made Him known? Are, are we making sure the world knows this truth? An old mentor of mine, Tim probably knows, Talmadge Johnson, former general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene, he said it best when he said it this way. He said, the world at its worst needs the church at its best. And so for you and I, we know what we must do. Know Jesus. Stand for Jesus. And share Jesus. May that be so in us. And through our lives and through our influence. Not just today, not just Easter season, but each and every day of our lives. May that be so. I'm going to invite Pastor to come. And I want you to know how much I appreciate God's work in your hearts and your lives. The influence God's given you here. May we be good stewards for the sake of all those who follow in our footsteps. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I told you you wouldn't be disappointed. My heart was moved. And we're so thankful that Tim has, that God has guided his steps here so that he could share with us. And I was sitting there thinking, it is more than just being moved. We must engage. And we have the promises of God. You have been placed here. I have been placed here in this time on purpose. And God has everything that we need to help us to accomplish his goal and his purpose for not only yourself, but for our nation. And so we don't leave here. We leave here realist. We recognize we're in a fight, but we also recognize that we have won who has won every fight that we've invited him into. And we're bringing him into this one. We're going to be what he wants us to be so that he can bless this nation again. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for the words that we've heard. They've reinforced our hearts. We live in a world in which the news and the general atmosphere seeks to gnaw away at our faith, perhaps cause us to begin to doubt. Maybe this is a lost cause. But Lord, then we hear your word. Then we sense the stirring in our heart by your spirit. And then we recognize that God, you desire to win this fight. You desire to bring America back to a place of favor, back to a place of blessing again. And so, Lord, we engage. We put our little hand in your hand, and we say, O God Almighty, order our steps, order our stops, open our mouths, help us to declare, help us to stand for the right, help us to do our part, And that multiplied with the impact, added impact of your spirit, we are going to see America saved again. And we're doing it, as he's already mentioned, not just for a nation. We're doing it for the generation that is here and the generations to follow. We thank you, O God, that you're at work. We yield today to your spirit. We yield to your guidance And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, kingdom of heaven, come. Will of God be done. For the glory and honor, not of the United States of America, as much as we love this nation. No, no, no. For the glory and honor of him who died and rose again. For the glory and honor of Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God God bless you. Have a blessed week. God bless you.